Welcome to the Strength Theory of the Unexplained. I'm your host, John Ventry, and today we're going to look at Ray Palmer and the Shaver Mysteries. I remember Lemuria, um, the Maury Island case, and Kenneth Arnold. Welcome. All right, let's start off with, uh, with Ray Palmer. You can see from the uh, first slide here that he co-authored the Shaver Mysteries, and uh, interestingly, this one on the right here, Amazing Stories that you see, I went to the Pulp Festival in Pittsburgh last August, and I'm looking, and, and I started asking, you have anything on the Shaver Mysteries? There it is. They had the cover of the Amazing Stories, the Amazing Stories issue, so I went and bought it. So that was cool. I got it, and now I got the books, and, and I'll show you those in a second. So Richard Sharp Shaver, that's the guy's name, Sharp Shaver. You can't make, you can't make this stuff up. Richard Sharp Shaver was born 1907 to 1975. He was a steel worker here in Pennsylvania in Berwick, PA. He was a member of the Communist John Reed Club. He was a uh, actually a mental patient twice, two years in Michigan State, and then again for eight years in Iona State, where um, Ray Palmer said he was actually in a catatonic state for years. So this guy's been in and out of, uh, out, out of hospitals. And he talks about having past life memories uh, as someone called Mutan Mian in Lemuria. And Lemuria is a planet. It's not the uh, the story like Atlantis in the Atlantic and Lemuria in the Pacific, which they used to refer to as Mu. But it's totally different. But you'll see that he gets a lot of ideas he's borrowed from other stories, is what you'll see with, Ray, with um, Richard Shaver. But he bought his first copy of Amazing Stories uh, back in 1926. And Amazing Stories was the first sci-fi magazine in America, was the first one uh, of its kind. Uh, he was a follower of the occult, the Rosicrucians, and Madame Blavatsky, who's credited with uh, the start of the New Age movement, and she was Russian. He said he was stalked by a demon uh, by the name of Max, and he said that the demon, Max, killed his brother and it kind of tormented him through his life. He said he could read his co-workers' minds, like he would have a weld, he'd be working, and he'd have the mask on and a welding tool, and he could hear what all his co-workers were, were thinking. He ended up passing away in 1975 due to uh, lung cancer, and Palmer passed away two years later in 77, and they were actually became good friends, and Palmer had moved twice, and he moved also to the same area, and they were they were lifelong friends. So Ray Palmer, he publishes this this I remember Lemuria Shaver Mysteries from 1945 to 1948 for about four years. That's the main theme of Amazing Stories that he's publishing. And the, the circulation of the magazine when he started this increased from 135,000 to 185,000 uh, issues a month. So that's a 50,000 uh, increase per month in issues. It's about 75% of everything that they published over that five year span was about uh, the Shaver Mysteries. And if you look at today, if you look at MUFON and Fate Magazine, Combined, they may publish 8,000 a month, and Fate Magazine only publishes two or three a year, and MUFON publishes monthly. So combined, they're not even 8,000 a month. And back then, this one magazine was 185,000 a month. So Palmer was uh, four foot eight tall. He was deformed uh, as a child. What happened when he was seven years old, he ran out into the street and he ran right into the spokes of a truck and he got tangled into him and broke his back. That's why when you see this picture, you know, uh, Richard Shaver is not seven feet tall. He's probably my height around six feet tall, but Ray is only four foot eight. Shaver looks like he might be six two. So, what ha the way he met him is Shaver originally sent his uh, Atlantean Mantong language 
And Shaver published it in 1943. And he said that um, he had it authenticated and it was a real language. He said it was a real language. So he used it, but it wasn't until two years later in 45 that he actually uh, published the Shaver Mysteries. And you can see from this slide, all of the covers of amazing stories. I love the pulp art. I think it's cool. And uh, you know, they, the pulp art uh, festival comes to Pittsburgh uh, every August. So that's something I like to go and I listen to the stories. Like la last year, they talked about Edgar Rice Burroughs and Tarzan. And every year they feature a different person, the shadow, that type of stuff. So as far as the story, what it was really was good versus evil. And uh, they had the Darrow. The Darrow was the evil. And they were giants, the original giants from Genesis, but they originated on the planet Lemuria. They were able to use mind control. They had death rays. They could shape shift. Um, and he said gravity and radiation stunted their growth on Earth. So when they came here, they were bigger. Then over years, the, it, it shrunk them down over gravity and radiation. Some of them became part robotic. Some of them left and returned to the stars. Uh, they tortured, they ate, and they harmed mostly women. And anybody who discovered them and knew about them, they would go after and try to and, and try to harm them. Uh, he Shaver said they held him prisoner for two years, but those were the two years he was in the mental hospital. Fred Christman said he had met the Darrow. Now Fred Christman's an interesting guy, and we're going to talk more about him. Christman, Christman was involved with the Maury Island case. He says he met the Darrow, and then he said he, and he was also involved in the JFK assassination. So Christman has to be uh, working undercover. There wasn't a CIA back then in the 40s, but he's working for the government as an operative is who he is. And then like everything else, when you start putting a story out, uh, women started coming forward saying that they were being abducted by the Darrow and they were being raped by the Darrow. And they said that there are certain office buildings and cities that you can take the elevator down to the basement. And when the door opens, it actually goes into a cave system and, and you could find the Darrow in there. And people were believing that, that if you go down an elevator, it could take you to this subterranean uh, world. The Terror were the good guys. And they would defend the humans against the Darrow. And the Darrow were human looking. And Shaver said there were many planets and many races. There was one planet called uh, Satana, where there were goat-legged horned titans. Now, that's just a takeoff on Satan, goat-legged horns. So he copied a lot of his ideas. Again, radiation and gravity shrunk them over time on Earth. And uh, some of them left for other planets. They left Earth. So how original was Shaver's story? In 1917, you had John Carter of Mars. In 1928, Buck Rogers appears in Amazing Stories. That was the first time in 1928. And then uh, Flash Gordon uh, is in 1934. So the whole thing with death rays and, and, and spaceships and all of that, it had already been out for about 20, 30 years. He, was, he didn't originate that. And it was in Amazing Stories. Now, Palmer, what he did was he received a 32-page manuscript with 10,000 words, which is nothing. Books today have to be a minimum of 80,000 words. This was only 10,000 handwritten pages. And what Palmer did was he rewrote it. He also renamed it. The original story by Shaver was called Warning to Future Man. And Palmer was the one who reworded it as the Shaver Mysteries, or uh, I remember uh, Lemuria. Now, Palmer goes to Shaver's house because he wanted to visit with him. And he says he's in bed at night and he hears uh, five voices uh, with different languages. And that's a demonic marker. And he jumped up and he checked the room for speakers. And, you know, and he went out in the hallway and, you know, they were asleep in, in the other room, Shaver and his wife. And he was hearing voices in in in, the, in his house. So he said, there is something to this. And and I've got the book here. This is, um, this is a, a first edition. I remember Lemuria and the return of Sathanas. 
So that's a first, this is actually a first edition book that I bought from a rare bookstore. And this is, this is it by, and it's by Richard Shaver. So what's this book was not co, co-written. So Palmer, the, you know, the storylines are very dark and pessimistic with ray guns, flying machines, evil overlords, controlling the surface, inhabitants, half human beings. And Palmer then hires uh, writers to write some of the stories. So the, the whole, that's the only way they could get four or five years worth of storylines and, you know, maybe 40, 50 issues uh, put out uh, under, you know, talking about this. What happens though, in the 1950s, uh, nuts and bolts, scientific investigation of UFOs and ET stories win out over this dark, hollow earth, hell-like uh, storyline that, that Shaver had of the Darrow creatures and some spiritual reality. So it, it lost, in 1948, basically, it was losing its, uh, after the UFO wave of 47, it started to lose its, uh, its appeal to people. So then there's accusations that Shaver copied uh, his ideas of an underground uh, species from Edward Bulver Lytton's 1871 novel, Vril, The Power of the Coming Race. So uh, Palmer's response was that Bul Bulver Lytton had also visited the Darrow Caves, but that that is totally different than hollow earth theory because these came originally from outer space. If you look into Hitler, part of his belief in the master race, the Aryan race, came from this book. This was a novel from 1871, but talked about an underground race, like an, it's an Aryan race, and I'll get into that later. Uh, and they had crystals and they had powers, and, and Hitler wanted to acquire anything with power that he could win, you know, the world conquest it was what he was trying to do. So John Keel, who I respect a lot, and I, I, I like his books, and I think he's pretty accurate, uh, he said basically that Shaver invented the UFO field. He said if Shaver and Palmer had not existed, there would have been no flying sources. It's that simple. I disagree with that because of the UFO wave in 47. Uh, he said it's actually similar to uh, L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics, uh, you know, based on an alien race, a religion. And he said it's nothing but another devil theory. So what happens is the FBI visits Schaefer and Palmer in 1947 after the Kenneth Arnold uh, craze. Uh, and it's interesting, everything I've read from back then in the 40s, uh, really, you know, these books that I've, I've read here from 52, 47, there's no mention of Roswell. No mention of Roswell. No mention of Roswell in... Uh, the uh, sign project, the original saucer report, the first one, they don't mention, they mention all these other cases, not Roswell. So uh, the FBI says it's causing mass hysteria. There's complaints for the society of, uh, for the suppression of vice. Um, UFO reports were being sent to Amazing Stories and they were publishing it. So that's how now the UFO field is starting to get a lot of publicity in the news. The uh, publisher, William Ziff, stopped publishing uh, the Shaver Mysteries around the end of 1948 because he said he got a lot of complaints uh, from sci-fi fans, let's say, and um, a petition from Forrest Ackerman. And Forrest Ackerman went on to be the publisher of Famous Monsters of Filmland. I've met him a number of times. Matter of fact, at the Chiller Theater in, in New Jersey, I went to his house in, in uh, Los Angeles. He gives tours. And it's really cool. He had models in the basement of Earth versus the Flying Saucers. He had the original model uh, in the basement. It, it was so cool. That's where I got the idea for in my basement, I have all the horror, sci-fi, Bigfoot, UFO stuff. I made my basement like his with all of this stuff and a, and a library. But the thing to remember, too, is that science fiction back then, then the reason they got complaints was science fiction was uh, about future inventions to help humanity. That's what it was. It wasn't about creatures and aliens and 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 uh, horror. Shaver and and uh, Palmer made it that, and that's why there were a lot of complaints. 
So uh, Palmer stops publishing, and he says it's due to the G-men threats was the reason, not complaints. It was the government threats. And he creates fake magazine, True Tales of the Paranormal. And uh, I've always been a fake subscriber uh, before I joined uh, MUFON. Uh, the first issue of Fate Magazine is the Kenneth Palmer story of the nine UFO seen by Mount Rainier when uh, Kenneth Arnold was uh, flying his plane. So that's the first issue of Fate Magazine, and this is the first issue of Fate Magazine. So, so the question is, and then they come out with a book called uh, The Coming of the Saucers. So the question is, we know Palmer exploited Shaver. Did Palmer also exploit Kenneth Arnold? Because Kenneth Arnold is, is in the field believed to be 1,000% credible. And this is, you know, what he says is the Bible in the UFO field. But he hooked up with Palmer. And we'll, we'll get into that. So what happens is John Keel now starts copying a lot of Shaver's theories. So even though Keel would argue with him on TV shows and, and, and fight with him, and, and it, he copied his ideas of Earth being visited by giants and aliens, uh, humans created by aliens, interdimensional, and a cult control system over people, victims see and converse with aliens, and that they can alter our reality. That all came from Shaver and Palmer, and Keel copied it. And Keel wrote the Mothman prophecies and a, and a lot of other things. Palmer's magazines also were the first time that the, he created the government conspiracy theory and, and, and excuses for anything that went wrong. It was, it was a conspiracy theory by the government. And he also basically created the UFO genre. He did that before all these big cases came out. And like I said, Roswell was in the papers for two days and gone. And nobody talked about Roswell again for 30 years until 1979. It was gone. It was a forgotten about story. And he also was the one who created the... Uh, in 1959, Palmer said UFOs came from a donut, a, a hollow Earth, but there was a, a, like a donut. The Earth had, was hollow in the middle, like a cylinder, and that's where they were coming up from. And, and, um, and, and that there was a, a, a race down there at the North Pole. Uh, Palmer wrote about the Admiral Byrd flying over, a, a, you know, discovered a vast uh, wasteland in the North Pole. And Palmer borrowed his ideas from Worlds Beyond the Poles. But they, that's a book, but they got it all wrong. Bird actually flew over the South Pole, Antarctica, not the North Pole. So he got that whole thing wrong in his magazine. He ended up apologizing for that. And Bird never saw or said anything about seeing forests and large animals, uh, you know, in Antarctica. In 1961... Palmer said the Navy covered up the bird flight. And Palmer um, continued to promote the bird theory through 1961 in his Flying Saucers magazine. So let's talk a little bit more about Ray Palmer. I, 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 when we originally talked about the Shaver Mysteries and I read it and, and all of that, I said, I got to find out more about this Ray Palmer. He was actually should have been a more famous name. So I bought this book, The Man from Mars, Ray Palmer's Amazing Pulp Journey. And I think the pulp fiction is actually cool. You know, it's like the start of the comic books and that is the pulp fiction magazines. So I bought this book and read it and I found Palmer to be absolutely fascinating guy, absolutely fascinating. He should be a big name like Ray Bradbury, but nobody really knows who Ray Palmer is. So let's talk about Palmer now. Ray Palmer was born in 1910. From seven years old, he spent two years in a sanitarium recovering from when he ran into that truck and broke his back. But he received the first spinal graft in America and it left him hunchback that you saw in that picture because it was the first time they had done that. Uh, like Shaver, he bought his first issue of Amazing Stories in 1926. At 20, he ended up having a spinal infection as the graft uh, failed, 
and he spent another two years in the hospital. And, and he claims, and this is true, that he willed himself to heal. He would focus every night, and when he went to bed, that his back was healing. He focused on it. He used the power of his mind to heal himself. And doctors said, we don't know how this happened. It's a miracle. The guy's back is fused now, and the bone has grown, and it healed. And two years in the hospital, he was able to walk out. They actually said he was going to die from the infection, and that it failed, and uh, he walked out. Um, he also said that you know, he loved amazing stories. He bought that in 1926. He said he then focused on being the editor of Amazing Stories, and he willed himself in 1938, Amazing Stories uh, hired him as the editor, and he claims he willed himself. And I, I, there is truth to that. I think the power of the mind, and, and you can will things to happen. You can alter things if you're determined enough. Hitler was another one that used the power of the will. He, he was 100% would not be stopped and used his willpower to, to get where, where he got for a while. So, um, again, science fiction, you got to remember, science fiction stories back then were all about future inventions to help humanity, to benefit mankind, and they had to be scientifically accurate. You know, if you said there was going to be a communicator like Star Trek, well, how does that work? And they would explain it. And Palmer changed all of that. He changed the sci-fi genre from inventions to stories. And a lot of people hated him. A lot of people hated him for doing that. Uh, you know, he changed it to action, weapons, creature, and then the occult. He brought the occult into sci-fi. Fans blame Palmer for killing off science fiction and amazing stories. Because amazing stories, you know, was starting to go down also at, at some point. Uh, Palmer adopted the trends of spiritualism and Eastern New Age thought. Madame Blavatsky, he started getting into that. Palmer also wrote his own or published a, an invasion of the body snatches story in 1946, nine years before the actual book came out. So Palmer was an intelligent guy. I read his book. This was as well written a book as I've ever read. Um, I, I, I thought it was I thought it was great, um, and even the the the, um, the the one that we're going to talk about next, the coming of the saucers, you know, by Kenneth Arnold and Ray Palmer. Ray did most of the writing. Both of those they were as well written as I've ever read uh, anything. He also published Isaac Asimov's first two stories in uh, Amazing Stories, and he published I Robot, the movie with Will Smith. He published that also. So, I mean, Amazing Stories back then must have been a huge, huge, you know, fan favorite. People would couldn't wait till it hit the newsstand. Uh, Palmer popularized the conspiracy theory for everything that went wrong in Amazing Stories. So, so you know, he, if if the printing press broke down, they couldn't get their issues out on time. They had pr trouble. He just added in the magazine that the government interfered with the the publishing of Amazing Stories, and and you know, he created. He created the conspiracy. Nobody has ever talked about government interference like that. So complaints mounted regarding the Shaver mysteries. When the publisher was probably talking to Palmer, we're, going to, we're not going to keep publishing the Shaver mysteries. It's been almost five years now. Palmer goes down the street and, with another guy and creates Fake Magazine. So this first issue of Fake Magazine, he, so he would take a two-hour lunch break, go down the street, and he had another partner, and he, he used an alias. He didn't put his name in, in this as Ray Palmer. And it was years. It was like two, three years before he came out and said, that's been me all the time. I did Fake Magazine. The reason he did that was he wanted to do an all- uh, you have an all alien uh, flying saucer issue with amazing stories and they rejected it. He wanted the whole issue to be about, and I don't know why they would reject it. They rejected it. So he said, all right, I had enough now. I'm going to do it myself. And that started uh, Faith Magazine was the UFO genre. So Palmer leaves amazing stories. It's like January of 1949. And he now, in his magazine of fate, he's talking a lot about flying saucers and hollow earth theory. 
And fate would explore everything, the paranormal, folklore, hidden knowledge, uh, you know, New Age thought, Eastern uh, philosophy. And Palmer is referred to as the man who invented flying saucers. He publicized it so much that it became a genre. Now, who knows that? Who knows that Ray Palmer is the guy to start all these genres? Flying sources, hollow earth, you know, conspiracy theories. Uh, it, it was an amazing guy, really amazing guy. So then Palmer partners with Kenneth Arnold after he had those sightings at Mount Rainier. And sightings incre increased through July of 1947. It was a lot between Kenneth Arnold, Roswell, uh, Maury Island, and a few others. And the Air Force starts Project Sign. Some people said called it Project Saucer, but Project Sign in 1948. So Palmer then hires Kenneth Arnold to investigate the Maury Island case. So he says, hey, look, you're the most famous guy right now. You're all over the newspapers. I'll give you $200. And it's not far from where he lived. Fly there and investigate the Maury Island case. And it, at first, Arnold didn't want to do it. Then he ended up saying he'll do it. And uh, Arnold went on to sell his story to, uh, to uh, Fate Magazine, which was the first issue of Fate Magazine. And then together, uh, they co-write the coming of the sources book. And that's, that's, and I tell you, they, those books were as well written as anything I, I had read. So, uh, Major Keogh, John Keel, and others say there's a military cover-up to the UFO. And there really is, because every time the military, the Air Force has gotten in to try to explain it, it becomes completely something else, all this other propaganda in there. There is, and even today, even today with what you see with the uh, Pentagon being involved now, they're gonna, read, they're gonna look at UFOs again. You're never gonna get the truth from that. It's not going to happen. They control the narrative with a lot of disinformation. So here you see the cover of Fate Magazine and the coming of the sources. You can get it in two different colors. This one with the women with a, a hula hoop saucer looking at the stars. So you can get it with the, the cover of the, the first cover of Fate Magazine. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about Maury Island because it's really interesting also. Did it really occur? So Kenneth Arnold flies uh, to Tacoma, to Maury Island, and he gets off the plane. He doesn't have a hotel room. And uh, he's asking for hotels, and he's told we have a hotel room for you at the Winthrop Hotel, which is, a, which is like the Waldorf. It's a high-scale hotel. And it turns out the room is bugged. So somebody paid for his room, and they bugged it, and they knew every single conversation that took place in the room. So this guy by the name of Dahl, he, uh, he says uh, June 21st, which is three days before Kenneth Arnold sighting on June 24th, that he saw six donut-shaped UFOs, and he has pictures of them. He took pictures of them from his boat. So him, his son, and his dog were on a, a, a patrol boat, and he said that uh, slag from the UFO, one was kind of losing control, and the others came to help it, and then it kind of discharged a whole bunch of slag, white metal and, and kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, lava rock type slag. And it hits his boat, causing a lot of damage, uh, broke his son's arm, and killed his dog when it fell from the, from the sky. Now, that all should have been confirmed in my reading. There was no confirmation that with the hospital or anything that the son broke the, his arm. Did he have a dog? No, there was nobody checked into that. Uh, but Dahl says that he's visited by a man in black, you know, meets him for breakfast and warns him to drop the case and don't talk about it if he knows what's good for him and his family. Fred Christman, who is Dahl's boss, and Christman, as we know, has a history working for the government. So they meet with Kenneth Arnold and they show him basically robber locks, rocks. And, and Arnold says, what is this? This can't be what it is. Uh, a, a guy from the United Press calls Arnold, tells him your room is bugged and this is what you said in the room. So now Arnold doesn't know is Chrisman or Dahl talking to somebody else. He repaid, repeated the conversations word for word. And later on, right after they all met, 
he would get a call and he says, well, it couldn't be Dole or Chrisman. They're in the room with me, so it can't be them. So, so Arnold, uh, Arnold contacts his friend with United Airlines, Captain Smith, for help. And Smith goes with him uh, to do this investigation. And then they also contact some friends they've made with the military. Um, and, and this is, I think, is in August now that they're doing this investigation. So the two military officers show up to, and, they, and they take the evidence, you know, they take statements, the evidence, and they really weren't, weren't interested in the rocks. They were only interested in the photos, which never showed up, and uh, what the storyline was. But, but Chrisman gives them, Dahl and Chrisman give them these lava rocks. They take it with them. And what happens is a couple of minutes after takeoff, the plane crashes and two people parachute out. But these two officers who are UFO investigators for the Air Force um, in 1947, they're piloting it, trying to save the plane, I would imagine, and they end up crashing and they die. So now the mystery becomes even bigger. Did somebody kill them? Did they try to destroy the evidence? So. Uh, Arnold then goes and inspects the boat that they said that they were on, and he says there's no way that this is the boat. It's not seaworthy to start with. There's, there's no damage, minimal damage on it. He says this is not the boat if this thing even occurred. Um, he goes back, he meets Dahl, and they go to Dahl's secretary's house uh, where they had met. So he goes back on his own to that house to talk to the secretary. The house is empty and there's cobwebs. And he knows that is the correct house. He jotted down. He knew exactly how to get to it. And now, so now Arnold is fearing for his sanity. It's like an episode of the Twilight Zone. How did the house, how is the house empty? He looked through the windows. He saw the same kitchen, the same furniture. He says, this is the house, but now it's got cobwebs. This makes no sense. Um, Arnold ends up flying home at that point and uh, his plane crashes and he crash lands it, he's okay. And he and then he inspects it and it turns out that he himself at some point turned the fuel valve off. He had taken off, started flying and he turned the fuel off. And he says, why would I do that? So now he's worrying about his mind being controlled by something. Because he said he's never done that. He's, fl he's flown so many times. So he thinks he's under mind control. So Chrisman and Dahl deny the UFO story to the FBI when they're interviewed. They said that they made it up. And Dahl's wife said, well, he made it up. I told him to, to uh, deny it. Now, the only problem is when uh, Palmer speaks to them, they said, no, we never denied it to the FBI. That's a lie. So the FBI is saying that they made it all up. The FBI visits Amazing Stories, and, and they had shipped uh, evidence to, Amaz to Fate magazine, and the, the FBI wants to see it. Now, these pieces are different. They're smoother. They're like Rava Rock, but they're more metallic and smooth. And so they, he shows it to the FBI, and then uh, Palmer says the next day he comes into the office, it's been burglarized, and the samples are gone. But he did, he had already sent them for analysis. So he got a analysis of these rocks and the rocks in, um, in Murray Island were analyzed also and they're different. It comes back with different properties. So there's something, there's something to this. Now, Chrisman and Dahl both disappear. Uh, Chrisman is single. They had never been to his house, but he, he, they're told that he left on an army bomber to Alaska. Civilians can't get on an army bomber. So it ha he has to have connections with the government in order to do that. Dahl's married with kids and they just disappear. Nobody ever heard from Dahl again after that. Crispin pops up later with Kennedy. And he appears at the JFK assassination. So, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that Chrisman is working for the government uh, in, in a number of different projects. So Project Saucer, which is really Project Sign, starts January 22nd, 1948. And those Air Force uh, officers who died, Davison and Brown, they're investigating this in 1947. So, you know, so apparently the Air Force is doing these investigations before there's an official 
investigation put together called Project Sign or Project Saucer. But we also know, though, with the Battle of L.A. in 1942, uh, General, I think it was Marshall, had asked for the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit to be formed in 1942. So I think that something was already in place, and that's where these two, Davidson and Brown, came from. They were already part of the Air Force's branch to investigate UFOs. So they list, again, all the cases trying to say, look, UFOs are real, and they give a whole bunch of cases, U.S. international cases, no mention of Roswell at all. So Project Saucer says that all UFO cases are in the U.S. That's not true, because uh, Palmer sh showed a list of them um, overseas also. And, he's, and the Project Sign or Saucer says that they're all of earthly origin. And we know, I don't know, you know, we don't really know now, 70 years later, where they come from. They say that the technology, it's earthly origin from Spain, Spain, uh, and uh, that Nazi scientists took their technology to Spain. But we know they didn't go to Spain. They went to Argentina and there were agreements with Juan Perón down there. And actually a thousand patents were put, were made in uh, Argentina from Nazi scientists. So the whole thing is a lie. The other interesting thing now, if you look at the UFO field, back then they called them flying saucers, but this report, Project Saucer, Project Sign, called them UAPs. Um, and that's the, t the terminology that's being used today. Unidentified aerial phenomenon. And everybody says, oh, they made up a new term. No, that was the original term of the Air Force was UAP, not UFO. UFO didn't come up later until, uh, uh, it wasn't Major Keel, was the other guy I couldn't remember. So, you know, the interesting thing is Davidson and Brown had no interest in these samples at all. Uh, when you read the book, Smith, who's helping uh, Arnold, he w three or four times he whispers something to Chrisman during the interviews, and, and Arnold doesn't know what he says to him, right? And then at one point, Smith says, I gotta, I gotta go, trust me. He comes back with military intelligence. So I'm wondering if Smith wasn't in on it the whole time with Chrisman, and they're kind of using Kenneth Arnold as the fall guy. That's what it looks like to me. So they analyze the fragments, they're different, uh, different report than the slag in the area. You have the hotel room that's paid for and bugged. Crispin and Dahl don't want any money for this story. They, they actually originally said, don't print this. We're sorry we got you involved. They tried to convince Kenneth Arnold to leave and not print it, not do the investigation. Arnold kept insisting on where are the photos of the UFOs? You said there are photos, where are the photos? So they never produced these photos. The boat that they claim was damaged is totally unseaworthy. Uh, Chrisman, before all of this, had written letters to Palmer to try to get him to stop publishing the Shaver Mysteries. So Chrisman is in the middle of this. Arnold says he filmed all the interviews and filmed his entire investigation. Where's the film? That never has come forward. So did Murray Island actually occur or you know, this is August, are they trying to discredit Kenneth Arnold with his sightings? That's what it sounds like. I don't think any of this maybe in Murray Island actually occurred. And this is so typical of what you get when the government's involved. It's incredible. So let's get back to Ray Palmer. So, so that you can see how Palmer's in the middle of the entire UFO genre getting it going. He is the, he is the guy. So, uh, Palmer breaks his back again for the third time in 1950. And under morphine, Palmer writes a book called How Do I Know I'm Alive? And he's talking about alternative realities, another genre that he'll, he'll be pushing in uh, Fate magazine. In 51, Palmer starts Amherst Press, and he starts linking the occult, UFOs, Urantia, Ops, and uh, bringing in UFO religion. So another thing that you can credit Palmer with is UFO religions. And he gets involved with the contactee movement in California with Adamski and Van Tassel. Another big thing in the 50s was these contactee movement in California. And there's Ray Palmer in the middle of that also. Ray Palmer makes the mistake in 1953 of selling Fate magazine to his partner, the one that helped him start it. 
and uh, he starts Mystic Magazine. He just figures he could just start a new magazine because that's what he did all along. Uh, Fate Magazine grew to 120,000 issues a month and Mystic just 20,000. So he made a big mistake by, by, selling, uh, by selling Fate Magazine. In the 50s, the pulp industry collapses really due to paperbacks that started coming out in the 1950s. Paperback books, television, think about it, you know, people got their TVs in the 50s. Porn magazines, you know, like, like uh, uh, Playboy and others, and uh, comic books. So all of that stuff started to come out in the 50s and just kind of killed the pulp uh, industry. So Palmer starts advertising his chili seasoning in his magazines and, and Kenneth Arnold. So they're friends now, just like Shaver. Arnold's advertising his uranium prospecting and he's got dandruff cures. <laughs> you know, they put that in the magazines. Uh, Palmer no longer pays for stories. Like if you write a story now and give it to Fate Magazine, I think they pay you $50 or $100. I've always asked them to just extend my uh, membership, you know, for another year or whatever. Shaver gets into painting, he's artistic, and, and he starts hearing and seeing our history. He sees faces in rocks. He's actually selling these rocks. He's got a rock business. And he says, I, I can tell you the history of Earth through these rocks. And he sees faces in them. In 1960, DC Comics names Adam Man Ray Palmer. So that, that might be the biggest contribution. If you watch Adam Man, the character's real name is Ray Palmer. So that might be the biggest uh, thing that happened to him, you know, history-wise. Palmer takes on other causes like being against DDT, against Vietnam, atomic weapons, and he does help fund uh, Navajo uh, hunger and, and, and blind children. When I went back to the magazine, there's ads in there for them. Uh, Walter Winchell, who's famous back then, contacts J. Edgar Hoover, and he accuses Palmer of spreading communism now uh, through through his magazines. And they do, and the FBI does an investigation, and they don't find anything. They don't find anything subversive in the magazines. So Palmer then accuses America of propaganda, which I think is probably pretty valid. And all governments put out their propaganda for what they want to control. Uh, Palmer says the Jesus movement is as harmful as LSD, and he rejects Christianity, and he was raised as, as, as a Christian. Um, Palmer publishes his autobiography, uh, and that's where this name comes, The Man from Mars. Uh, his autobiography is The Martian Diary, and it bombs. Nobody buys it, and he is devastated. He's thinking that he's the big thing, and nobody buys his book. So... Palmer then moves to the far right. So if you're thinking Palmer is like a left-wing liberal, well, he, he's actually a far right. Um, you know, he's against the New World Order. He's very pro-America, pro-freedom, um, even though he promotes conspiracy theories. In 1960, he hires uh, James Oberg as a co-editor. Oberg is the guy you see as the NASA spokesman on all the UFO shows. So, you know, I mean, they, they all seem to come together. Oberg, Chrisman, all of these people uh, all seem to be tied together. Uh, and they, now they start talking about the hole in the pole. And you can see the donut-shaped earth. And this is where the uh, UFOs come from. And uh, Paul McClaims, he had seen uh, a 1929 newsreel of uh, Admiral Byrd. And now it's gone. So it disappeared, but he saw it and he that's where he got his information from. And he said UFOs come from a donut shaped earth. It's kind of like the flat earth theory also. In 1966, Shaver and Palmer get into a, a, a fight, a match. Uh, and and uh, Shaver says that Palmer never rewrote all, any of his stories, that all of those stories for five years was his. And there were no co-authors or rewriting. Palmer comes back and says, look, I didn't make Shaver, but I made the mystery. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. He took it and he embellished it. In the 70s, Palmer fixates on the origin of UFOs in heaven, and he says they're all connected. And that's interesting, because my personal belief is the alien abduction is a demonic infestation. That's my belief. I don't think aliens do abductions. I think that's a demonic infestation, like a haunting is what it is. But he's first again saying this, and Valet, Jacques Valet and John Keel agree, and so do I. 
1947, he published that UFOs are not physical and cannot be captured and they're interdimensional. Think about that. When he started uh, Faith Magazine, he's saying that UFOs are interdimensional. And again, he doesn't believe there's life in space. And I don't either. I think it's interdimensional. I don't think there's life in space. I think everything comes from Earth. But he's saying this now 75 years ago. And I think he's the guy that's right. Palmer suffers a stroke in 1977, and he dies two years after Shaver. Now, let me give you some quotes from himself and from other people. He says, Rod Serling must believe in the Twilight Zone in order to write about it, because he obviously believed in the things that he wrote about. He says, I offer ideas, not proof, <laughs> which is a pretty cool line. Uh, he says, fiction shapes reality, and I think sometimes it does. You know, the, the, the stuff that Star Trek showed, like the communicator, well, you know, now, now you got it. Where's my Star Trek picture right there? So, you know, and, and now you got it. It does sometimes uh, shape reality. And then he makes this quote, since death do us part, marriage does not survive the afterlife. So you have no connection to your wife. So a lot of people be happy, others would be sad about that. That's cool. Death do us part. Marriage doesn't survive death. Uh, Sci-fi writers scorned him as a panderer of the fringe, but they also said he was a strange genius. He was absolutely incredible. Um, and they said, look, this guy created the flying saucer genre, hollow earth, new age, alternative realities, the contacting new movement, and conspiracy fields. He might not have created them, but he certainly promoted it enough that it became a thing, a genre. Keel said Palmer kept UFOs alive from 1957 to 64 when nothing was going on, but it was still in all his magazine. And Palmer's rarely mentioned for his influence in any of those fields. I contacted the Pulp uh, Festival, uh, Mike Chomko, and I said, why don't you do a show on Ray Palmer? From what I learned, this guy is absolutely amazing. And he goes, you know what? 2026 will be the 100th anniversary of Amazing Stories, and that's exactly what we'll do. So we still got a four-year wait for that, but I can't wait for real experts to talk about it. You know, this is just what I learned from a little bit of research. So Palmer was referred to as the P.T. Barnum of pulp, and I think that quote is the best. He's the P.T. Barnum of the, of the pulp magazines. Uh, Palmer says, hey, no one listens to a polite man. Uh, he says, everyone has a touch of psychosis. I've always said that. Everybody's crazy, just some people more than others, <laughs> you know. I think it's the, the, the crazy people are the genius people who are the most creative and come up with a lot of, a lot of books in order to come up with that. Um, they said Palmer also laid the groundwork for the Dulce, New Mexico underground base story. And that whole Dulce, New Mexico with the aliens underground, it was based on the Shaver Mysteries and also laid the groundwork for shows like The X-Files. It's because of, of his magazines. Fate Magazine was basically silent about Palmer through the years. They would have the 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, 40 year, 50 year anniversaries, etc. They only mentioned Palmer once as a co-publisher. Uh, they, they, it's like they wanted a distance. I know his partner, the one who took it over, wanted to distance himself from Ray Palmer's embellishments and creativity, and uh, and that's what happened. So now, interestingly, uh, in 1996, a Hugo Award vote was done, and I remember Lemoria came in second to Animal Farm. That is a huge achievement. This book, I remember Lemoria came in second place to Animal Farm. But who knows about this? Very, very few people know about that book. So, you know, in conclusion, are sightings into, in, influenced by the media and stories? And then a lot of people have said, yeah, a lot of the 1950s TV shows, and then people started seeing that type of stuff. But I counter that with, okay, well, if people then start seeing the creature that's in the movies, I don't know anybody who says they saw a predator or the alien creature. They came out in the 80s, right? I've never had a UFO case where they saw alien or predator. So, you know, do, maybe it influences it, but uh, there's an example where it doesn't. I would say in this UFO field after, I've done this since 98 for 24 years, don't believe everything in the field. 
something happens in these cases, maybe the sighting, but then the whole story seems to morph into something else. <laughs> it really does. You know, uh, it's been 80 years since the Battle of L.A., and I consider the Battle of L.A. in 1942 more significant than Roswell. That was the case that started everything. First time we denied UFOs, first time we used the weather balloon excuse. That was the first time we shot at a UFO, hit it, and couldn't bring it down, yet they said it was a balloon. How do you, how do you, you know, you fire 1,433 rounds and you can't take a balloon down? So to me, that was the case. So we're 80 years from since the Battle of LA, and we don't know anything more today than we knew in 1942 about UFOs. Very, it's, like, it's like Ray Palmer said, it's interdimensional. It's like a ghost. You can never, never grab it. You can never capture it. So another cool uh, quote was prior to the age of materialism, which is really the Renaissance period, we were in touch with the spirit world. And I said that in my books, that prior to Jesus, let's say, is the reference I used, I, I believe that the angels and fallen angels and the Nephilim and, and all of that, the watches, fallen angels showed themselves and they were able to morph, but it was all the time you saw them. And that's all the stories you see from back then. And I think after Jesus was born, I think they could no longer walk among us, but they still interfere and sometimes show themselves, but they can't last very long. The other question I got, and I said this prior in, in my book, said mental patients, are they really crazy? Or did they always stay in touch with the spirit world? So they're not really crazy. Their minds are still in that connection. They never were able to put a block up like we are. And we're not, as, the more we get away from that connection that we had 2,000, 4,000 years ago, the harder it is to make the connection, but they kept the connection. I was at a conference in Baltimore in 2016 and I gave my presentation on the Battle of LA. And a media guy there, I can't think of his name, but he's well known. If I can remember his name, you would know who he is. He, we had a drink and he said to me, John, most UFO <coughs> stories fall apart upon analysis. I'm still waiting for one that doesn't, you know? And I said, well, you know, I think Battle of LA was a good one. And, you know, that's why I said, well, maybe that's true with a lot of them, but there are some that are good. And in February 1942, Battle of LA was absolutely good. So... Like Ray Palmer embellishing a lot of the stories and creating the uh, genres, today we have our version of P.T. Barnum and Pinocchio, and that's Giorgio Tsoukalos. The more he tells stories, you can see through the years, his hair grows. Unlike not his nose like Pinocchio, his hair grows. And you can see from this picture on Ancient Aliens, the more he told and embellished, the more his hair grew because I don't believe very much on the Ancient Alien TV show. Not at all. So um, this is the 75th anniversary of Fate Magazine. I took this presentation after putting it together. I said, you know what? I'm going to write it up. So I wrote it up and I sent it to Phyllis Galdi of uh, Fate Magazine. She goes, I love it. Great. And it's it, it should be the lead story of their next issue that comes out at the end of the year. Uh, the 75th anniversary, this is going to be the lead story among a lot of others regarding how Fake Magazine was founded. So I think that's super cool. That's one I'll buy some extra issues and give to the kids and grandkids. The other thing I want to mention is I just ran for governor of Pennsylvania, and nobody in this UFO field has run for that high in office. Uh, uh, Steve Bassett ran for a congressman, but uh, governor is a higher position. So nobody in this ufologist has ever run for governor. And I can tell you, the, in the beginning, they, they, they tried to minimize me by saying he was the head of a, former head of a UFO organization, you know. And uh, the media completely ignored me. There were four debates. I won all four debates. Clearly, the candidate said to me, John, you won another one. And the media would not cover me. Facebook uh, has me shadow banned, even still, when I, even when I put out the UFO conference posters and stuff, they limit how many people can see it because of my political posts. And uh, I had all these people who said that they got a petition from me and mailed it. I didn't receive any of them. I, I received some petitions, 
but uh, there were so many, and I called people I know. Did you mail it? Oh, yeah, I mailed it to you. I went back to the post office. I said, are you holding my mail somewhere? Because I had a small P.O. box. It wasn't a big one. I said, maybe you couldn't fit it, and you got a stack of my P Nope. They said, we're not holding anything. And so I, I got... I needed 2,000 signatures, I got 1,876, and I believe that my petition somewhere in Pittsburgh, that they got me flagged as a, as a, you know, a, a, a Trump patriot terrorist or something, you know, and they're, they're, they're monitoring my stuff. And, and I know that to be true because my, my monthly statement for my pension, I used to get it every month, a statement, Here's, here it is, direct deposit, and uh, I, I only get one out of three. I don't get it every month. Every other month, I only get, of a year of 12, I might receive four. That's it, three. I, I don't know where it is. I don't get it in the mail. And I get my mail. I'm retired. I go out and I get my mail. So, you know, for, for those of you who think that this new thing out there is going to get us disclosure with the Pentagon and the Navy, and that's the other thing, the Pentagon is the public view. The Navy is the private view really doing the research. It's not going to happen. It's really not going to happen. This is all, all being controlled narrative by them. So I, I think I have 95 lectures now on YouTube uh, with this one. I got one more and we're going to do. And in 15 years, I've published 13 publications. And that's this episode. And I'll see you at the next one. Thank you.